talking about the topic, the pursuit of sustainability. Yes. Um, with this audience, I want to tell them that you know, you've won many CSR, many sustainability awards. As a businessman in infrastructure and energy, what exactly does the word sustainability mean to you and why is it important? You know, there's a saying, you know, self-denial or, or self-deception is not the worst thing we do, mm. but it's the reason we do the worst things. If we uh, deceive ourselves that uh, sustainability is not an important issue in the corporate world, especially in my area of business like power, cement, these are all heavy stuff, they are heavy polluting stuff. Mm. So when you are aware that you are in an industry that you, you must uh, compensate and pay back as much as we can through uh, doing as much good as you can, possibly physically can. So in, in the context of sustainability, we already saw DNA and green in our DNA of YTL. That's why they, all these unsung heroes, they, uh, they, they say that the softest pillow is a, is a clear conscience, my stuff. Most of them understands our DNA of sustainability. They know they work for a company and with a company, and they win awards, the Queen's Awards twice, unprecedented in Wessex water. Mm -hmm. All of them can sleep peacefully because they know we are at least giving something back mm -hmm. from all the businesses that we but do. Not, but not a lot of people think like you. What makes you do the things that you do? It's common sense because uh, you know the, the, the damaging consequences if you do not. Uh, do the things that you try to, to, to uh, bring, put something back, what you take from the mm. resources, natural resources. You have to put something back. So we've done quite a lot in many areas. In Wessex Water, for example, uh, we uh, recycle human waste, 250,000 tons of that, and made it into biogas, into energy. Mm. And also, we collect all the supermarket food before they go to the landfill, so you know, we also turn them into energy. So we produce something like the 16 megawatts mm. of uh, power through this way, recycling that. And then wind turbines, another 12 megawatts. So we try to get everybody involved uh, in a lot of these areas. How do you ingrain this sort of sustainability thinking into your corporate DNA? And, and what's the biggest challenge you face? How easy is it to get everybody in your company to think the same way as you do? I, I think I must confess it's my faith. They know my faith. I'm a Christian. So, I mean, the, the, we, are, we are actually stewards of God's resources. So if you have a faith like that, uh, I don't think uh, you, you can deny or run away from that fact. People will judge quite a lot on your faith. Are you serious uh, in what you do? Are you really putting back something? Or are you a corporation just for profits and all the spin mm. About, mm. about sustainability? I think from day one, before we even be grew to what we grew, they already knew uh, that uh, we talk about sustainability. For example, in Pankola, when we started the hotel business, I already had this idea that we got to have a naturalist to make sure that people appreciate the jungle, mm. right, so they don't chop it down, etc., and preserve all the forests. There were only 22 hornbills, now there are about 2,000 hornbills. You know, can you imagine the environment that thrives? Nature uh, you know, has a way of, uh, of, of multiplying if you do all the right things. You don't have to do much, you just have mm. to care, and then the people understand all of that, and that's it. Okay. If, is, if you want the best result in the world, for, that's what it does. Is there a real way you measure your sustainability efforts? Is there a metric that you use? How do you know that all your efforts are actually paying off? Is there something that you use in terms of measurement? Okay, there are, there are voluntary carbon uh, uh, measures of how much carbon emissions you create from your businesses. So we voluntarily uh, uh, report all of that, and we make our people aware that, that whatever you do. For example, our latest uh, uh, in Niseko, when we took over the hotel in Niseko in 208, the Hilton mm -hmm. and, and the Greenleaf, straight away we are f asking the team and the staff, how do we put back something back? So we discovered there were uh, thermal, geothermal waters that we could uh, uh, recycle to, uh, to use for heating. Mm -hmm. And then we also recycle the natural hot water, cold water system to defreeze the mm -hmm. snow in, the, in winter and also the onsen when you heat them up. So when, when the staff knows the owners are that way inclined, then everything just sticks off in a mm -hmm. very nice Does way. being sustainable always mean you make money? Or does it mean sometimes you lose money? 
No, I think it's a fair balance. Uh, you know, I think corporations have to be very aware of what's going on today. If you're a public business company like ours, there are already big corporations like Nordia or the Norway uh, uh, Sovereign Fund that will not invest in companies that do not have a sustainability track record. In fact, uh, uh, some of these funds, Norway are trying to withdraw 70 billion of uh, investments in fossil fuel uh, plants, for example. So you've got to be very careful already. I mean, you can't run away even from that. If you want investors, you have to have a track record of sustainability and you can't just spin about it. You're either doing it or you're not doing it. Mm. But do you make money when it comes to sustainable activities? Uh, we try to make money in a different way. We, form a, we bought a Norwegian, uh, we bought a company from the Scandinavian and combined it with our Malaysian expertise. And we were one of the biggest uh, CDM uh, creators. 500,000 tons of carbon emission were mitigated through our ability to, like, for example, uh, give them CDMs through palm oil and then sell, sold them to Europeans. So we bought companies like that. Not that profitable, but it's very useful, again, for the DNA of the group. Why are mm. we doing this? Because we do this to make Malaysians more aware that palm oil, you know, uh, the, all these issues have got to be uh, dealt with, especially Malaysia was at that time one of the biggest palm oil producers in okay. the world. Let me rephrase it in another way. When you look at these sustainable efforts that you put in, do you always make sure they become profitable at the end? Or... <laughs> Is there something that, you know, you, how much would you sacrifice profits okay. just to pursue sustainable activities and where do you draw the line? I think most people consider something as a cost. I look at it as an investment. So I'm not subjected to the tyranny of quarterization. I have got long-term sust uh, sustainable business uh, models. Uh, for example, Wessex Water or Sarai, they are concession perpetuity. So I have all the time in the world, so no shareholder is going to pressure me on my mm. profits every quarter and, and force me to cut sustainability because I'm not giving enough returns or dividends to them. And also, of course, my family owns more than 50% of the stock, so I have got my, my shareholders and my major shareholders aligned. Our interests are aligned, so there's an, I'm not a minority shareholder or CEO that tries mm. to uh, subject myself to the tyranny of the shareholders' interests at the expense of sustainability. We, we know we cannot do that. We know if, if I am not doing what I do, I don't think I would have so many staff that stayed with us for this long. I have quite a low turnover of staff because, like I said, most of them have a very clear conscience when they work with YTL. Conscience is one thing, but bottom line, does it hurt? No, it doesn't hurt. I mean, look at my profits. Does it hurt? <laughs> it's been going up. We've invested one million in me in 1986, and we have done this sustainability thing. It would be worth, what, 157 million today. So how wrong can that go? Mm. <laughs> would you turn down projects if it meant unsustainable practices? Yeah, definitely. What have you turned down? Oh, projects that are unsustainable. Like what? <laughs> Like what? For example, if somebody wants me to build a golf course in a private island, no? Why well, want to raise down all the trees and put a concrete jungle when you are trying to preserve a concrete even jungle? Even if it was so lucrative? Yeah, even if it's so lucrative. You would turn it down? Yeah, definitely. What are we doing? I mean, when you make money, where do you go? I mean, you want to go to some resorts that are very nice, etc. It's now a Faustian bargain. All the money you make, right? And you have no place to go because there's so much destruction in the world. Look at all the pollution and all the places. Where can you go nowadays that are sustainable? Right, so it's getting to be a Faustian bargain and, and this self-deception got to stop. Mm. Not a lot of CEOs are like you. What sort of leadership is required at the top to drive something like that through a company? Well, I say sustainable it's, it's, it's my faith, so that's natural because I feel I'm a steward. Uh, that's quite natural. And so in that way, if you practice what you preach, so at least, you know, people uh, believe you a bit. And it's just from a very young age that we care about that. You, you look at my daughter, why she's mm. uh, win winning so many awards and she's such a tree hugger because she knows the DNA is like that, the daddy was like that, you know, they were always looking after the trees. So you can't hide this stuff from uh, future leaders. You are or you are not. So I think the bottom line issue is, is uh, something that is very interesting that... Uh, uh, the CEO of uh, one of the biggest uh, food companies, Paul Colbert, he said he's not going to report quarterly uh, uh, 
balance sheet and profits anymore. And uh, he lost, I think, 90% of the hedge funds that invested mm. with him. And good for him, he says. So he's now not subjected now to the pressure of these uh, short, short-term shareholders. Mm. And now he can do sustainability. Mm. And he thinks it's a fantastic thing. He's done a marvelous job okay. to uh, look after the resources uh, of the world and putting it back nicely, not under pressure for okay. the bottom line. Let's there are more and more people like that now. Let's talk about these shareholders because shareholders expect, expect returns. Shareholders expect a certain amount of earnings. Um, on a certain amount of time frame. How accepting are shareholders these days about the sort of impact coming from these sustainable activities? How accepting are shareholders, not just your green investors, but generally, how accepting are they in accepting that, you know, if you want to be sustainable, there might be some negative impact on your bottom line? It's uh, very interesting. I think it's the other way around. If I'm not sustainable and doing this personal practice, my shareholders will put me under pressure. I think my shareholders, if you look at the list of my shareholders, they have not left me from fidelity in the US to all the institutions in Malaysia and individual shareholders. I see the EGM, I see many faces that have gray hair. When we had black hair, it would be a gray hair. They're still around. So I think because they they love what we are doing. So I don't think I got pressure the other way around. I've never had an issue in the EGM that says, Boss, can we cut down on sustainability of wasting too much? Never so far in my career, but maybe this seminar will attract questions like that after this. But, <laughs> but I've never had this. It's the first time I've been asked like that. I thought it was a given. <laughs> but they would put pressure on you if you lost money pursuing these sustainable activities. Well, thank God we haven't. Yeah. And that's why we are making more and more money. That's why yeah. we are doing sustainability. Well, very few companies think like you in terms of leadership. What role do you think the government can play? in terms of you know, getting companies to be more aware, be more sustainable in terms of their behavior, in terms of their I activities? I think uh, sometimes come, uh, governments must legislate and be quite strong in some of these areas uh, against uh, huge pollution, for example. Even China is now trying to do 70 uh, gigawatts of the, uh, wind turbine by 2017, for example. I mean, that's fantastic. India wants to have a wind wind power to every home by 2019. That's huge countries. So when, we, when I hear countries that are moving and government that are at least aware of the issues of, uh, of, of, of uh, climate change and all these issues, I'm, uh, at least it's not like Sisyphus, you know. Mm. You are alone rolling the stone up and then the stone falls down and then you roll the next day, same thing. But I think more and more uh, investors, sovereign fund investors, and uh, ethical investors are demanding corporations to do that. Mm. Uh, not only governments. Governments should also use their stick sometimes to make sure that the future generation has a chance. Mm. Right? We are, sometimes we say we borrow from the, the future generation. I think this time I would say we probably stole from the future generation. I think we have ripped the environment so badly. And if we go on like that. I, I think uh, it, it would be a very sad world. I mean, Lee ka talks about uh, sleepless in Hong Kong. Uh, Paul, uh, Hank, Hank Paulson now talk about the tyranny of quarter, quarterization. He has now shifted his attention to saving the world, uh, not to uh, have unsustainable practices, for example. I think more and more serious people are aware of the consequences. Look at climate change. Mm. I was uh, skiing in Closters and it's a green Christmas. I mean, I go all the way to, to the Alps because I love a white Christmas and it's a green Christmas. Mm. You know, so, I mean, how do we deny? It's coming nearer and nearer mm. to us and you still are in denial, self-deception, how long? When you look at governments that you deal with, and you deal with a lot of governments, which ones would you rate doing a good job when it comes to um, getting companies to do sustainable behavior activities and which governments do you think have a long way to go I in think promoting it, uh, this area? Uh, most Europeans are, are, are naturally quite conservative in their areas, including not allowing, for example, in France, shale gas, for example. So quite conservative in their way, but Europe, for example, are quite a, a guardian of, of uh, values of sustainability. I mean, whatever the economic reasons or not, I wouldn't comment, but for me, uh, the values are there. And then Asian economies are beginning to understand. I think Singapore does a good job. Malaysia, we have also got practices. There are eight initiatives 
to uh, from fit-in tariffs to to green buildings, etc. Like Singapore, EDB is uh, alternative. I, I'm aware of what's going on uh, mm. around. Uh, Japan is also quite strong yeah, in this area. Korea is also quite strong in this area. But more and more, China and India are the biggest uh, polluters, and they know uh, if they don't do anything about it, you know, we are not going to have a very pleasant world to, to live in our children or grandchildren. Yeah will have a very tough time in the environment. Mm. Should governments offer tax incentives, you think? Yeah, definitely. Uh, carrot and stick. You, you should legislate uh, compulsory non-pollution and hit very hard for those people who pollute. And then, car again, uh, carrot for those who actually do it. You know, I'm quite sure the government can do something like that. Most governments are trying to do something like that anyway. But, mm. uh, Maybe they're too distracted today, the economy, palm priming, everybody is a bit distracted by the present economic malaise. So they are not concentrating on these issues. So we lost six years of non-concentration on this. So you can imagine six years on how bad the world has become. Mm. Particularly in Asia, we're seeing overpopulation, overconsumption, pollution. I mean, the, the list goes on. I mean, very soon resources are getting depleted because population growth is growing so fast in emerging Asia. Um, how bad do you see the situation getting in developing and emerging markets? Very bad. I, I think water issues, this is just a report recently from all these major papers of China's water problem. China is admitting they have a water problem, huge water resource problem, and, and this, these problems can lead to war because there's a lack of water. You know, water needs 60% for agriculture and then for mm. personal consumption. There's not enough water. The way we are handling the resources like water, for example. We are wasting water because there's so much subsidized water. There are not, water's not treated well and done well. There's no framework for people to invest in it properly with a sustainable long-term investment like Wessex Water. In the UK, at least they do it right. They've got a regulatory mm -hmm. framework that allows you. They don't care who you are as long as you're you do all the right job, you make your profit, pay your taxes, they are happy. And the licensing makes sure that you produce great quality water at a good price. Why can't the world do that, for example? This is what I hope Europe's lessons mm. uh, what, of what they did not do, ASEAN will do. This 600 million young population with tremendous potential, high saving rates, I think very quickly, we do not act quickly, mm. right? We will lose this great opportunity to create infrastructure for water sustainability, all these issues. If we do a transparent, regulatory, coherent framework for investment in infrastructure with sustainability today, we would not be needing to subsidize water. Because we subsidize water, water is so cheap, people waste it. Electricity, the same. So we're wasting a lot of resources of mispriced uh, uh, energy and all of that. It's got to be regulated. What I'm, I don't mean is to, hey, have a great, a big price. Always do like England, like Britain. What is it that Asia can afford? The prices of electricity and water. For example, in Asia, maybe 3.8 cents per kilowatt hour. We started that. People thought in Asia, the average price was US 8 cents per kilowatt hour. We started our power plant in Malaysia at 3.8 cents per kilowatt hour. We showed the way. We financed it in Ringgit. We did the first 15-year bond. There are only solutions by the private sector if you want one. So the point is to keep the electricity price at 3.8 cents per kilowatt hour, which Asia can afford. In those days, the poorer you are, the more you will pay. Mm. India will pay 10 cents because mm. you are poorer. Nepal will pay 50 cents. I mean, the poorer you are, the more higher you pay, you get punished. So that's not right because there's no framework for all the best investors locally or foreign, the expertise yeah. to invest in it. That's still lacking. And I hope ASEAN will come up with a framework to let the world and their own investors and their own entrepreneurs invest. There are enough expertise and enough money in this area, but they are not spent in the infrastructure mm -hmm. properly. Look at Indonesia, look at the traffic jams today, look at the water resources mm -hmm. that they are lacking today. They must be solved very quickly. Five years from today, it gets more expensive. Land gets more expensive. You want to do a real fast reel to even that's very good for uh, carbon emission uh, 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 reduction. But the land is going to be very expensive, the infrastructure, because maybe people cannot afford that train anymore. 
for example, ASEAN is still quite cheap land-wise, everything. If we miss this golden opportunity in the next decade to do all the things, what Europe never did, to put all the infrastructure, all the, all the resources correct, the water, the electricity, all priced correctly, regulated clearly and transparently that the world can invest. Mm. I think the world wants to invest. I think Credit Suisse, this is a conference, I see so many big hitters here. Who doesn't want to invest in great companies with tremendous potential? But the trouble is this big elephant in the room, there's no coherent, transparent regulatory framework. There's some framework and sometimes they, they are not coherent. Five years later, they want to change their mind. First, they want to allow foreign investors to invest uh, in the infrastructure. Thereafter, no, no, I don't think so. I want to take back. So these, are, these incoherent policies are not good. However, Christine, ASEAN has learned to do something correctly in a regulatory framework. And what is that? To attract foreign direct investments. All of ASEAN countries from Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines, they've done well. Why can't they extend that to infrastructure? sustainable mm. infrastructure in the areas that we talk about. Just extend that. They have already got a track record on FDI that provides jobs for the local economy anyway. Why can't they extend that? Those tax credits that you say. This time only say the Asian uh, economies at this time, the next 10 years, we can only afford power and water at these prices. The world will fix them. There's no money and expertise in the world to fix them. So I, I pray and hope that this is the opportunity you know, uh, for players, sustainable players. There are many of them, I know, like fellow colleagues of mine who love an opportunity to invest. Which in fellow way. colleagues are these? I know my friend Ayala Group, <laughs> Jaime, he's also invested in water, yeah. Philippines, a great friend. He's also sharing the same view as me. Yeah. He wants to do sustainable practices, he wants to invest more. But again, in, uh, in Philippines, framework. I understand he was also knocked about a little bit. He invested in it and then there are criticisms. Maybe he made too much profit. You know, all this incoherency shouldn't be there. Once you set a framework, that's it. You know, you, you let, the only way you take back the license is when they do not produce water at the price that they set up in that framework. Otherwise, don't be jealous halfway of people making profit. People have a right to make profit. They pay taxes after that anyway, hmm. right? Hmm. You talk a lot about Asia. So far, you're in Malaysia, you're in Singapore, Indonesia, I suppose, as well? Yes, we are in Indonesia well. with Java Power Plant. We are on the second biggest power plant in, uh, in, in Indonesia. So potentially, if the framework does change, which of these other markets do, do you want to do more work in? All in ASEAN business? markets. We are, we are now working in Myanmar, in Vietnam, in, the, in the Indonesia, everywhere. I see the potential, but I lament that there's still not a a transparent, coherent regulatory framework for this. Just extend what you do for FDI to infrastructure, right? Then the bonds can be rated, mm. uh, project the risk can be mitigated because everyone's following the same rules. Mm. So why not? Singapore and Malaysia has done quite well. We yeah. hope the fast train project uh, will accelerate this kind of thinking. Mm. Uh, the fast train from KL to Singapore, which was our idea 12 years ago, finally the two governments have agreed to do this project. I don't care if I win or not. I hope I do, but, but, uh, but the point is somebody does it at the right price and it's sustainable. Well, you will take uh, 20 million cars off the road. Sure. You know? I mean, it would be great for things and economic, mm. all the wealth effect would be fantastic. I, I love to see all of this, Christine. Okay. Well, I'm still young. You're still young. If, if ASEAN gets its framework right, uh, let's just say, let's just assume if it does get its framework right, things are perfect. Which projects in ASEAN or around the region would you go for? Which one would be interesting? It's to the you? same. Infrastructure is infrastructure. What, what is, uh, I'm doing utilities. Yes. The, the word utility itself comes from the root word to provide something very mundane for the average guy's needs, something basic, not something yes. luxury. Mm. So water is what people want. Power, uh, power is what people want. Internet is to me also a utility. Mm. That's what people want. And we have actually spent more money than the US on 4G uh, in the, in, as one nation. We, we network the whole nation, 80% of the population are now covered. And we are actually having 10,000 schools with kids, 6 million kids connected with parents, 2, 3 million and, and teachers. Can you imagine those kids today, the transformation? They're using Google Apps, mm. Google Apps. Now they're enjoying the Mets Khan Academy, they're enjoying the, the, the teaching of Frog uh, virtual learning system from Britain. Their English improved, their maths improved, 
It's unbelievable. Mm. So these these kids, millions of kids, are now being brought up technologically mm. uh, with the best of class, best in class technology, and also content. Mm. And Obama came to Malaysia. I had a chance to chat with him, and he was quite stunned that Malaysia actually implement this. He actually had this program called. Uh, uh, to, he has the same program to actually network whole of the U.S. Yes. with all the students and then asking all the sponsors from all these Google and uh, Apple and all these people to give the kids something free. And they are thinking about that. He has not implemented it. Malaysia mm. we implemented that. That is a big change in the mindset, for example. Uh, and this also saves a lot of uh, resources by remote, uh, you know, mm. uh, uh, controlling all these... Uh, uh, energy and all that stuff. So I, I think Malaysia is doing s certainly something correctly, you know. Again, the policy is not well understood. Most people always criticize it. You know, change is such a difficult thing sometimes. Hmm. Every time you, you, you change something, it just upsets people a bit. But for me, my whole life is about blue ocean, about changing, about seeing change, and uh, I just enjoy. But I must say the last six years, because of the quantitative easing, there is very little change. Mm. It's, it seems the world so kind of stopped and did not want to progress anymore. There was quite huge leaps in progress yeah. until 2008, and then suddenly everybody seems can't afford to do the right thing, and that's quite sad. So un until we see some recovery on a global front, on the economy front, things will start moving along. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I hope. I hope. Yeah, the United States, like Yellen, uh, quickly raise interest rates. I know that's a, not a popular view. But to me, uh, when you introduce a, a kind of a, a, a prescription for uh, anti-depression, uh, economic prescription, when it's no longer in depression, depression, you cannot continue to give so much because then it won't win itself off it. Then the economy is not real and uh, it creates what's happening today. US dollar is so strong and then the other currencies so weak. The distortions are quite huge. Yeah, for stock market and the short-term players, it's fine. But as what Lee Gushing says, the, the, the biggest problem today is the disparity between the rich and the poor. It's getting worse and worse through technology and through not talking about sustainability and all these issues. The disparity is getting worse. So one day, all the rich people will have mm. to protect all their wealth by building 100-foot walls and electrified. Because mm. I, I don't think it can be safe because the, the people if you go to big cities, Tokyo or Hong Kong, you see people sleeping on the streets. What's the point of saying you're the mm. most advanced per capita income in the world and there are people sleeping on the streets? How much more you can ignore mm. these consequences? Mm. Let's talk about China because China is really interesting. It's, it's an economy that's slowing down. It's also an economy where pollution is a real problem. So unless, which one has to come first for China to, to take sustainable activity, sustainable behavior seriously? Okay, China has already learned today, uh, and Chinese people are very pragmatic, Chinese leadership. They already know the cost of pollution in Beijing and, and what it does to the lungs and to the brains. Yeah? If you have not enough oxygen, good oxygen, your brains deteriorate as well. I think they've got enough scientific studies on that. Water is, got, get, is creating stomach cancer is a big thing in, the, in bad water areas. They know all of this. So the Chinese uh, government, at least, has been quite pragmatic and quite outspoken and vociferous about what they want to do about pollution. Mm. They actually shut down a lot of cement plants that are polluting. They actually are trying to solve the water problem now. Would you go into China? If they have a framework, all China needs is to create a regulatory framework. China has done everything correctly today by themselves, by building all the railways and all that quite inexpensively. All are fine. But I think it's about time they introduce the world's best to compete with their best mm. and create a, a pricing mechanism that is priced to the market in utilities before it's too late. I think one day, while you're building all these railways and all these roads are fine, as the population get older, they need maintenance. Then, the, like Europe, when you come to an age that you cannot change, it's very difficult to talk about reform to Greece. You want to talk about but reform to Greece, to austerity? I mean, they voted it because yeah. they are saying they're going to get rid of austerity, for example. Yeah. Europe is telling you a story. You know, nobody wants to change. They can't change even if they want. Their demographics are not right to change. Asia, they can change, right? But if you, if you are complacent, 
10, 12 years down the road, we become like Europe. We don't want to change anymore. Like Sarkozy wants to introduce one more hour of work to France, he get kicked out as president. I mean, we may have unions very strong, we may have all these issues of Europe. Not yet, but before you, uh, you know it, 12 years down the road, I'm a little bit lazier and weaker than today, for example. I can still talk like this, I can still do a lot, but 12 years down the road, I may have only, and uh, maybe I just want to be like everybody today, relax, play golf, enjoy yourself. You think 12 years down the road, China will have changed its regulatory framework? You hopeful? It has to. It has to. I mean, China has done quite a lot in the pragmatic way in their currency, uh, latest to try to introduce infrastructure bank, for example. Mm. That's a good idea. Yeah. They're thinking along those lines, trying to convert the currency to be an international convertible currency. In that area, you can see they're very pragmatic. So they should also do that in the infrastructure space. Mm. They have enough players in their own country to take advantage of that. Look at Alibaba.com for the 10 cents and the Huanings. They have enough. Huaning owns a power plant in Singapore. But I think they have to introduce competition to the Huanings in China, right, to make sure that everybody mm. is this, uh, the framework becomes a bit more transparent and more coherent. It's good for China. Mm. The people of China will get the best of class in, in water services, in power services, from the best. So whoever. you think you can give Huaning a run for its money? I think the world will give Huaning a run for this money, but Huaning also gave a run for the money here. Yeah. Nobody could seem to beat Huaning. They want a power plant as well in Singapore. So they are formidable competitors. That's what the world is. It's great to have competitors of that class mm -hmm. so that you know, iron sharpens iron is good for the consumers. Okay. At this point, um, I'm sure there must be some questions from the floor. Um, this is Stan Tree, of course, Francis Yeo. He has many insightful answers about you know, the areas of industry that he's in. Are there any questions? Can you please actually put them on to your devices? Or if you could raise your hand, a microphone will be given to you. You can ask straight away, and Dantri will be very happy to take them. Any questions so far that you would like to ask? Am I so intimidating? <laughs> no? OK. Well, until they think of something. I'll continue with my discussion with you anyway. Um, in terms of sustainability trends, what do you see shaping projects in the future? I mean, when you gun for these projects, how will they look different in terms of the projects? How will sustainability, in, sustainability influence the projects of the future? Okay, okay. again, economic uh, common sense. Uh, in Saraya, for example, when I took Saraya, we had 750 megawatt of uh, heavy fuel oil. Mm. That's very high polluting uh, uh, fuel. So we shifted to a combined cycle. But not only that, combined cycles cost cleaner, mm -hmm. but we use the best in class, the best turbines. The, the turbines used to only have an efficiency of 38%, now it's above 50%. Mm -hmm. So we buy the best, it's expensive, but at least it's sustainable. You don't waste as much energy, for example. So uh, these are uh, stuff that, that uh, we love to do. So I think now any, Anywhere we go as a company where we take over in m and people already know our DNA. Mm. And the first HR group will come and talk to us. The first subject is sustainability. So you will see some company take over, it's like they have a whole chest in the cupboard, you know, not mm. touched. They had all the ideas in the world, but sometimes the owners didn't want to implement. So they're always so happy when we take over a company and say, these are the ideas, sir. And, and they are very pleasantly shocked when you say, yeah, implement mm. them, and fast. Yeah. You know? And they, they win awards because of that. How yeah. do you see technology driving innovation in a sustainability space? Where are some of the technological breakthroughs you see? Yeah. Like I say, in my 4G, now it's going to be 5G yes. uh, advanced. There's actually no excuse today not using technology. Mm. I think we can solve the sustainability problem. Is that what Kennedy or my says about, about wealth. Wealth is not created, uh, uh, it's created by the market, right? Uh, so as far as we are concerned, wealth or poverty is created by the market, by corporates predominantly. There is actually enough solution to solve the world's pollution, mm. even today, bad as it is, right? So the question is back, why is it that we're not doing it? It's very simple because uh, uh, it's green. 
is simply greed. Uh, we, nature being destroyed as it is, still God being so great as it is, still produce enough food for the world. No matter what you say, the Maltosian uh, problem won't happen because there's enough uh, soil to mm -hmm. produce food for another 100 years, 200 years. I'm mm -hmm. sure of that. But nobody can stop human beings from create, uh, throwing to tomatoes, uh, creating tomato rivers mm -hmm. to keep the price of tomato high, mm -hmm. burning wheat to keep the price of wheat high, mm -hmm. butter mountains to keep the price of butter mm -hmm. high. Mm -hmm. I think, what do you think that's about? That is greed. Mm -hmm. So I think resources and all that, uh, I don't know how government can legislate against greed. You know, I think uh, that's the fine line. Because the way we are wasting resources mm. and uneven distribution is simply uh, not going to be sustainable on the first scale rather than it's the social impact that yeah. is now creating Wall Street uh, everywhere. You're having Hong Kong having problem on the streets with mm. people walking and demonstrating Wall Street takeovers, all this kind of stuff. Why do you think it's happening? It's getting louder and louder and louder to our doors, right? Mm. So we seriously, seriously have to look into this. Okay, we have a couple of questions yeah. from the floor, of course. Yeah. One of them is how to deploy capital a sustainable way and still get decent ROI. Now, they're being really specific here. Mm. How do you do that in a in a sustainable way and still get very decent ROI. What is decent ROI in term in, in oh, your this is return of investment, people talk about what, 10, 20 percent of your equity or whatever. Sure. So I think that's fair, but like I say, I can't understand I'm blessed with having businesses that I got a long time to work on, mm. to clean things up. I'm not in a cyclical short term business. Now even in my cement business from day one, we already put blended cement. Uh, for example, uh, slack. We bought slack from uh, Bao Steel from Shanghai. They were going to waste, you know, these slacks are, are waste of steel manufacturers. They don't know what to do with them. So we say, hey, if you replace slack with Portland cement mm. and blend it with our research, we, we could actually use that for civil engineering projects and it's even better. So we've done that all the time with pulverized ash that could also be waste, wasted. We use that to, to use less Portland cement, use less energy to produce uh, Portland cement. This is the kind of thing anybody can do if they want to do mm. as a corporate, right? So end of the day, if you do the right things, I have now made profits from wanting to be good. So it's not so always a patient. cost. Patience? Yeah, and, Patience and because I'm a pioneer, and then it worked, and then it's, it's, we also got certified in Singapore, all our six cement plants on blended cement, for example. Singapore has very high standards on pollution. Their green and, their green and uh, building standards are very high, and I love it. So for us, it need not be a cost. It's, it's, a, it's a question that, that's not, not necessarily correct, that every time sustainability is not profitable. Right? I think it can be profitable if you, if you come up with some innovative ways and then do good in the process and make profits have like you, in the you, cement. Have you ever lost money on a sustainable project? Not yet. Not yet. Because I say I, I consider it long-term investment. I haven't cashed in on the investment yet. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. So far, right? they've been giving me very good returns so far. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, my mic apparently has gone my mic. my mic. Okay. So I'm going to use the, the, the hand mic. Um, what is the most attractive Asia infrastructure opportunity from an investor point of view? Again, like I say, if there is no coherent, transparent regulatory framework, Asia is not investable in infrastructure okay, yet. But if there were that coherent infrastructure framework... Oh, then India, China, uh, Indonesia, all of them will be investable. You know, Asia has the biggest savings in the world. Asia can produce like uh, Brazil, 100-year bond. If Brazil can produce 100-year bond, Asia can produce 1,000-year bond. But give good uh, framework for all the world to invest, long, stable, transparent, coherent, and I think that's it. That's uh, enough savings to, to do all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a question here about current low oil price and how it will affect renewable energy projects. Any thoughts on that? Again, this is, is always this kind of thing. Uh, renewable energy is always uh, at the expense of high 
fossil fuel. Not necessarily. If you look at the price of uh, solar energy, they have now reduced from 3 million per kilowatt uh, uh, per megawatt to now uh, the capex is now 1.5. Mm. Give them time with the China going the solar way and India, the way they are going, probably if they come down to fossil price uh, capex for coal fire plants or gas fire plants, then I think we have a chance also to uh, mitigate some of the uh, carbon dioxide emissions that are bad. Mm. Yeah. There's also a very interesting question about whether can environment protection only be achieved by regulations? How can we change the mindset and behavior in other ways? I think it's not regulations. There are enough regulations on that. Yeah. It's enforcement of the regulations. I mean, they are, they are polluting rivers all over the place. I don't see people being fined, those who are polluted being fined every day or so things like that. So hit them where it hurts. Yeah, hit them where it hurts. I think mm -hmm. regulations are regulations. It's the will to enforce these regulations. I think there are enough, Asia has enough regulation on anti-pollution, but I think the enforcement is a little bit weak. If they're very serious on the enforcement, then people will wake up and then they must be very punitive against pollution, for example. Uh, China was puni uh, punitive, they actually mm -hmm. closed plants. Uh, I know that uh, because uh, we were the first to do, again, in China, we invested in a co-gen plant for sustainability and all that and we weren't closed. All the plants around us closed, so we became profitable. So you're asking about sustainability, yeah, there we go. Another great example of sustainability actually makes profit, right? All the plants were closed, so there was no supply except ours. That's amazing what China did. So yeah, if a government is strong on enforcement, I think it helps. Uh, speaking of China, do you think emerging markets are at a disadvantage? This is a question from the floor. Uh, emerging markets, are they at a disadvantage in continuing their growth because of the rapid consumption of limited resources as they may not be at the point of considering sustainable options? Do you think emerging markets are at a disadvantage? I mean, we've talked about this before. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think everybody can do their part. We don't have to do big picture, big political issues like that. I think the question is, ask yourself in Asia, are we doing our part? Are we in self-deception? Are we doing our part to really, really do your bed in your house, to, uh, in your office, to corporate lease, your corporate, uh, your leader actually doing something about it? If Asia wakes up quickly to this for their own interest, they should be uh, quite, quite activists in this area. Mm -hmm. Every citizen in Asia should be quite activist against pollution. Of course, against corruption also, but against pollution uh, is, is uh, something that they must hate uh, vilely because it's going to affect their kids, it's going to affect their grandkids uh, very soon. Okay. So, uh, a question pertaining your Malaysia operations. What are your thoughts on the Malaysian hoo-ha, this is how it's spelled, hoo-ha on 1MDB's debt burden? Has the YTL group been approached to acquire their power assets? Well, I thought we were talking about sustainability. <laughs> <laughs> Next <was> question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in terms of Malaysia, in terms of their efforts, when it comes to say, sustainable behavior in Malaysia, how would you rate Malaysia compared to, say, other countries? Not bad. Malaysia has, like I say, done eight initiatives, including a, a For Good Index with Bursa and many other fit in tariffs. Uh, Tanaga actually buy uh, fit in tariffs quite, uh, quite consistently, so they uh, well behave in that area. So we are quite consistent in pushing the initiative. At least the government knows, just like Chinese government, it's against our own interest not to do that. There are enough activists in Malaysia, and the government is also quite sensitive. There is actually a ministry to look after the environment, right? Which is actually an anti-government thing. It's almost a uh, opposition within the cabinet. So I, I think, yes, they have, uh, their job is to make sure that the environment is looked after, yeah? But like all uh, governments, we need a bit more uh, uh, efficiency on the uh, enforcement side, and then maybe the balance will be much better. Would you like better. to do more business in Malaysia? Definitely. Malaysia, like all countries now, uh, because of this quantitative easing, are having an uh, uh, undervalued currency. And as, like a foreigner would always, like me, if I uh, invest in Europe or Australia, I will invest now because 
this, this phenomenon of US dollar being so strong against it can't sustain itself. It's not, it's not a normal situation, right? You know it will, it will not work itself out. It's against gravity. So somewhere along the line, I'm in a long-term sustainable business footprints, and I, I don't take the short-term view. So I think the currency is, is, is distorted and mispriced. So I would invest in Malaysia, or any foreigner should invest in Ringgit, because it's quite low now. It's, there's no need for uh, currency today for Ringgit to be at this level, or Rupia to be at this level, or Thai baht. And so is the Euro, so is the Aussie. So I think the world is quite investable as by default. Right? For me, a long-term investor, I look at this as a fantastic opportunity. We know that I, I can't change the world's uh, financial system, yeah. but I'll, uh, I'll take what it comes. We know that 85% of your power assets are overseas, but would you like to acquire more power assets in Malaysia? Oh, that's a round teaser of 1 AMDB. She's very smart, I isn't try, she? She's quite smart, you know? I'm smarter, no <laughs> comments. He's on to me. Is that a yes or a no? No comments. <laughs> I am interested to invest in Malaysia still, of course, okay. like I said, yeah, it's so still very investable. So I'll take that as a yes. I, not unless to your question, you, I just say, say investable. I didn't say in power, I said Malaysia is investable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Is there a chance that a regional sustainability framework can be built into the ASEAN economic community? We've been talking about this. Yeah, I suggested this community. in one little forum. Tanjri uh, Zeti uh, is also uh, heading the the financial policy central banks trying to do bilateral payment arrangement with the banks to harmonize the ASEAN banks, etc. And I suggested this uh, transparent reg that she agreed with me. Mm -hmm. And she said she's going to bring it up. I s it's, 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 I extend what they used to do, this framework of FDIs to infrastructure. That's all you do. It's not something they've never thought of before. You've done that very well, just extend this to infrastructure. And then that, would, that, that, that will really do the Asians good. Do you think that's the solution? That's the final, That's the ultimate. That's the big problem this. today. There is not a harmonization of regulatory framework. As a result, there's no consistency uh, in investors. Now, when you don't have a framework that's transparent and coherent, mm -hmm. you pay a price for inconsistency. You pay a huge premium for not being coherent or transparent. It's a huge premium, and I don't think Asia is. We are smart enough and hardworking enough and high savers. Why should we be paying a premium? We just got to think clearly. Mm -hmm. If that's the answer, if we've done FDI framework before and it's worked for us, just extend it to infrastructure. Put that in the ASEAN summit conference as one of the things they want to do. And if they sign it off, just like the tariffs now, 5%, they can do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. uh, this is a very um, uh, philosophical question talking about communist regimes, how they failed also because they have not been sustainable. Uh, does capitalism face the same destiny if we continue like that? Yeah, ugly, the ugly face of capitalism has read its head yeah. uh, more and more. And this is the point. Uh, Lee Gushing understands that. Hank Paulson understands that. Mm. Uh, Unilever CEO understands that. Most fund, uh, foreign fund uh, investors big ones, the Nordias of the world and the Norway uh, sovereign fund all understand that they can't invest anymore in non-sustainable companies. So yeah, so I think yeah, we are more and more aware uh, of the detriment. Mm. So corporately, I think we can't hide anymore. It's better that we actually do something about it in a, in a much more uh, passionate and, and enthusiastic way than and treating it as an expense, which is the main issue, is or oh, this sustainability is always an expense. It's not an expense; it's an investment for the future. Mm. Okay. Can I ask you a, a controversial question now? If, if you had not embarked on these sustainable efforts, what do you think your profits would have been? Will you would you have been as profitable or less? Or would I, I, I'm just trying to figure out if you had not done gone down this route. What would, it ha what would it have meant for in terms of the returns for the company? Would it have looked completely different? As I told you two examples, like the cement case, we actually made money, and the other way, the cement was not shut down, for example. It's, it's an indirect effect of profits. Yeah. So we, we did that not because we think that's going to happen, they are really going to close all the plants, but it's an indirect result of sustainability. So I, I can't really uh, uh, granulize 
uh, how much, how much uh, profit or loss uh, to the last dollar. Mm. But I know it has sustained us well in our profits, mm. directly and indirectly. So I, I, like I say, it's not an expense. So you do believe that being sustainable actually is profitable? I think so. Yeah, it's for me. 100% profitable? Yeah, I mean, you look at uh, my Wessex Water, we won the Queen's Award. So when we do a lot of these things like uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, human waste, 250 metric tons, 50,000 metric mm -hmm. tons of that, and we fund all the buses. Now the buses around the bath area use yeah. our uh, biogas, mm -hmm. and then so does our little buggy, Volkswagen buggy that goes around. Mm -hmm. Does it cost money? Yes, it costs money, mm -hmm. but it's good. It's good for the soul, it's good for the staff who works there. You know, they love this thing. It's, it's, it's also good advertisement. It's put up in CNN, CNBC, not CNBC yet. <laughs> BBC and uh, CNN, I think, uh, played a big role talking about this story of sustainability. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I think uh, indirectly and directly, if you measure it in advertisement value, indirectly because people spotted it, not because we choreograph it. Yeah. If you do good, people will find out. I think nowadays, frankly, with social network, uh, the social media nowadays, if you've got a story to tell, a real story to tell, mm -hmm. people will tell it for you. Okay. I think the whispers nowadays through the internet is, goes much longer than the shouts of advertisements of big corporations trying to shout what they are when they are not. Okay. I think nobody can actually lie now in this transparent world of internet. Is to manage a company under sustainability aspects easier for entrepreneurs than for managers? No, I think they're all the same. The values are the same. I don't think it's easier or harder. It's, it's a different thing. It's, it's, a, it's a conscience thing. And when people, like I say, work in a company and, and leaders are the same, uh, I think it's, it's a non-issue, non-question that. Mm. I think there's no difference. Okay. Um, we're going to close the session very soon, so if you have any last-minute questions, please do send them through before I ask my final one. I want to ask you this. Mm. What advice would you give companies, individuals, who want to take conscious steps in practicing sustainable behavior? What advice would you give? What lasting advice could you give? I would advise you go to the internet, all the advice on how to sustain them. <laughs> Don't get advice from me. This is the world of information, over-information. If you want to do something about it, Google the right questions. You may not know the answer, but you definitely can ask the right question. The most, what I, as an individual, can contribute to sustainability today, I think that Google will give you 10,000 ideas. Hmm. So I, I don't need to, you need to waste time for me. But if me. you had to give some advice from Tan Sri Francis Yo, from I'm, the horse's mouth. I'm not in advising business, you know. Yeah. So, I'm in the business of infrastructure, not advising. Okay, but if you had to give some advice from the infrastructure point of view, what would that be? Well, like I say, most, most I've learned in my life, in my uh, years with YTL, uh, one of the reasons uh, I have very low turnover of staff is because the consistency of the leadership and the legacy of having the softest pillow having a clear conscience when we work with YTL. We don't want to go into businesses that are not sustainable or, or practices or businesses that destroy families. We want to enhance families. Mm. We want to see families grow. We want to bring some good. We, we want to say we are forced for good. Everybody knows that. Our, uh, we, our, our, our main mission is our journey continues. It never ends. When you want to be a force for good, it's never is never a destination, it's always a journey. And, and I think that's my little two pen, penny words. Mm. Okay, finally, where do you see YTL? Five years from now, 10 years from now? Well, I'm seeing more opportunities today. Mm. Uh, I told Martin just now, finally, finally uh, there are some realistic deals coming through to the system. We just bought something in Brisbane and uh, at a very good price. Finally, there are some, uh, something is happening. There is, a, there is a calm before the storm, and that is since 2008, but I think the storm's coming. Uh, so if Yellen increase interest rates a bit, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, people will be in trouble because quite a lot of corporations are over mm. So I've been waiting for quite a while, patiently, for some of these fruits to drop. So it's been a long while since 2008. 
So it's about time. So I'm seeing some deals. We are getting some deals now here and in Europe and also in Asia. Mm -hmm. The returns are beginning to be uh, not as good as before, but beginning to be recognizable and uh, subjected to shareholders agreements, you know, which shareholders can agree. Mm. Yeah. Could we see a deal this year? Oh, I hope so. I hope so. Where would that be? <laughs> I, I, I depends depends on how fast Yellen uh, increase interest rates. You know, ask her. <laughs> but would you be interested to acquire more power assets in Malaysia? <laughs> it's the third time lucky, eh? No, uh, again I say uh, there are power assets in this region. There are also power assets in Europe. There are also utility assets, water assets also. The, now the regulators are thinking of allowing existing water companies to merge and to expand those days not. They, they don't want a monopoly system, they want to break it up, they don't allow you, you can only own one water company, they're thinking along that direction. So yeah, so there may be more opportunities for us going into the future. I am a little bit more excited this year than in the last uh, five, six years. Tan Shri, thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you, thank Christian. You. Thank you.